welcome everybody to our published legacies, um, alternative approaches to fieldwork publications, um, co-organized by myself, Leah Hewardine, and Dr. Zena Kamash, who's giving a little wave at the front of the room. Um, thank you very much for coming. Um, we're going to kick off this session uh, with a, a welcome and introduction by uh, Dr. Zena Kamash, senior lecturer in archaeology at Royal Holloway, and a very excellent PhD supervisor to myself, um, not so with any bias. Um, so we're going to begin this session with a brief look at the traditional forms of publishing before taking us, Zina's going to take us through some of the alternative paths that are available. Um, she'll focus on how we communicate archaeological ideas and why the style and nature in which we communicate that is so important. So Zina, would you like to take the lead? Thank you, Leah. And I didn't bribe her to say nice things. Uh, right, let's get these slides up. Okay. Okay. So, welcome everybody. Um, so, I'm just going to start um, with a, a, a quite general introduction, um, just kind of working us through kind of why Leah and I uh, are putting this together um, and what some of our thinking is. Um, so, I'm going to focus particularly on who and how. Um, uh, so who is represented, uh, who is representing, sorry, archaeology in publications and how that archaeology is being represented. Sort of sitting um, and supporting all of that is who reads our publications and how they read them. And I'm not going to talk explicitly about that because that is Leah's area of expertise. Um, but there will be points where I touch very briefly on that. So we are, or we should be, really good storytellers. Um, so um, Paulina Prestupa and Stephanie Fraunhofer here um, uh, really draw out very nicely the, the stories that we can tell from our um, excavations, the characters, the events, the plot lines. Um, but are we making the best of these opportunities? Um, and I'm going to suggest that maybe we're not quite. So who speaks for archaeology? So starting with kind of traditional uh, publications. Um, so this data um, is some of the analyses that have been done on journal publications, on antiquity, um, and the Journal of Roman Studies. So Journal of Roman Studies, not quite archaeology, but in that area. Um, and it's, it's quite bleak viewing if you happen to be a woman. Um, so, in antiquity, there's a ratio of one to two women to men listed as authors. Um, and for JRS, um, only 28% of articles are authored by women. Um, and in the journal's defence, that's not a, a bias coming out of that journal um, itself, uh, because women are actually only making up 30% of the submissions. So, there's a pipeline problem here. Why aren't women submitting? Um, to JRS. Um, so then narrowing down into uh, um, kind of developer-led archaeology in the UK, uh, uh, we're seeing our main focus of the next couple of days, um, and particularly drawing on Kate Hawkins' work. Ironically, Kate, I think, is running a session in Stream B, wherever that happens to be, um, and her brilliant work on... Um, uh, the study group for Roman pottery. Um, so in the SGRP, two thirds of the um, uh, women uh, are pottery specialists. So you'd expect that to then be represented in our publications as well. Um, women mostly contributing to client reports, um, about 78% of the respondents, um, and particularly low numbers um, for primary authorship. And so only 17% of women uh, are actually the primary author of those client reports. And 46% of women have no primary authorship whatsoever. Um, and that's a much lower number for men, 26%. So there are some real issues happening here. Uh, so Kate, together with Francesca Mazzilli and uh, the wonderful Sadie, who we heard from uh, this morning, uh, have also um, done some follow-up work on this. Um, and point to um, the regular absence of field archaeologists and specialists as authors um, in developer-led uh, publications. 
And some of the solutions they suggest are mentoring for publication, that could help things like the JRS problem, uh, more equitable citation practices. You'll notice that throughout my presentation, uh, I always give first names. First names aren't always a reliable indicator of gender, but they at least get us thinking about who it is that we're um, citing. Uh, and then alternative ways of crediting authorship. Um, and actually in a different publication, again, with Kate, Francesca, Sadie, me, and various other um, people uh, writing about ethics in Roman archeology, span uh, we physically drew names out of a hat uh, to agree on author order for that um, particular um, article because we had all contributed equally. Um, but this isn't just a problem in traditional publication. Um, it also appears um, in other ways, other fora that we use for um, communicating um, stories of archaeology. So I'm going to look at Digging for Britain. Um, I don't need to, I'm sure, give it a, an introduction. I'm sure you know it all uh, well. Now, in terms of the presenting team for Digging for Britain, doing a great job um, on representing a diverse profession. <clears throat> Excuse me. But when we start drilling down into some of the data um, in the actual um, show itself, uh, we get a rather different picture. Um, so uh, the numbers I'm showing you just look at three episodes from 2023, and I apologise, this is a bigger piece of work that I'm doing, and I have the data, I didn't have time to... Uh, uh, analyze it all, but this is representative of um, what's happening. Um, so in those three episodes, uh, that's 16 sites and 36 people in some kind of named expert role. That doesn't include the presenters. And there's a little bit of diversity there, but not a huge amount. So two of the experts have visible disabilities. One person talks in really interesting ways uh, about um, being an archaeologist with a visual impairment and the tactility um, of archaeology. But everybody is white, or at least, like me, white passing. Um, and when you know most of the people, um, it's probably more white than white passing. Um, and that same problem uh, with gender, so 11 women, 25 men. So uh, a slightly worse than one to two ratio. Uh, and all the university staff are men, which is quite irritating when you're a woman working in a university. Um, and the roles that women have, um, only two are um, uh, attributed as an excavation lead out of 16 people. Um, uh, and then we've got a range of other roles that you can see up there. Um, county archaeologists also in a, in a senior role. So these are the people telling our stories. Um, but they also are giving the wider public a view of what it is to be archaeology. Um, and this issue is one not just therefore of kind of publication, but also of our profession. Um, so we can't disaggregate those two things. So until we get our profession sorted, we're probably not going to get our publication problems sorted either. So it's a slightly bigger plea happening here. And of course, that who matters because who is telling our stories has an effect on uh, the kinds of stories that we go on to tell. Um, so it's a rather long quote from um, Flint Dibble here um, uh, in his very recent piece where he is um, justifying his choice to talk on the um, controversial Joe Rogan exper experience podcast um, with Graham Hancock. Um, and I'm not going to read the whole quote, but I think there are two parts of it that um, are stand out for me. We need to stop just talking among ourselves or to audiences of like-minded people. Um, so we have to try and break out of uh, conversations uh, where we sort of know that people understand what we're talking about. And how we present evidence matters as much as what we present. Uh, and this uh, chimed very closely um, with the, the thinking that went into um, this session. 
Um, and thinking of that kind of broader um, uh, uh, context, we don't exist in a little vacuum on our own as archaeologists. We work within a, a much wider publishing landscape. Um, and uh, these data um, came out yesterday, um, which is no reflection on how quickly I put my slides together. Um, uh, so this is actually um, a set of data from uh, a legal case um, in the US uh, where Penguin were trying to um, uh, uh, amalgamate with another big publishing house. You can read that story uh, in, the, in the post. But the two standout parts there are 90% of books sell less than 1,000 copies and 50% sell less than 12 copies. So if we're just going to persist in trying to sell books, we might be holding um, uh, a horse that isn't going to go very far. Um, and the creators of this Croft um, comic uh, kind of take this by the scruff of the neck and actually go as far as saying uh, that the future belongs to visual rather than verbal. Um, I think this is quite a, uh, uh, a um, challenge to us to take the future. Many people are aware of the Hollis Cross um, comic, if not really and easily available uh, online. Um, but it does things that we can't do in traditional publications, that we can't do so easily. Um, it plays in really clever ways with time and space, slipping between two different phases of time. Um, and uh, through that, it's very engaging. Uh, and then for those who want uh, the more detailed information, because it's online, it has hyperlinks to uh, more traditional reports. Um, at the ADS. So this is a great example of what we can potentially do in comics. But we're talking about legacies. And comics don't have a very comfortable legacy necessarily in how they interact with archaeology. And so with my friends and colleagues, Katie Sorley and Van Brook, um, we published this edited volume. Um, and the front cover features uh, the work of John Swagger, who we're going to hear from a little bit later in the session. Um, and archaeological material has not always been represented well in mainstream comics. Um, communities have been othered and damaged. I'm giving you the answers to those questions. Um, and that links us back to the issue of who. Um, so who has been, who should be involved in um, creating comics, um, where we are feeling disenfranchised and minoritized communities, um, we need to think about encouraging those people um, in um, and having their voices expressed um, through the comics. Um, and as you might have guessed from my um, inclusion of Flint Dibble, yes, I think archaeologists should take a more involved role in combating negative stereotypes and misinformation. Um, and the flexibility of a comic um, uh, as a mode of um, transmitting information um, makes that um, a very engaging way of trying to tackle some really quite difficult topics. Um, and in his analysis of the Must Farm um, social media program, uh, Chris Wakefield has also pointed out that the conventional media landscape is changing uh, and we have to start learning uh, the new, this new language. Um, uh, and he talks about uh, the kinds of content they curated uh, for Must Farm. And like Polis Croft, uh, what they did very well is actually focus on some processes of archaeological work. They kind of some of the black boxes that people don't often understand about how we work um, with uh, an intent to be open and transparent um, to break down some of the barriers uh, between experts and non-experts. 
Um, he also points out that there has been a reluctance of, from the developer-led sector to invest in these online platforms. Um, and that investment isn't just paying for a domain name, but it also has to include training, including support for any uh, uh, online abuse, which is unfortunately a um, given of our world at the moment. And as we heard um, from Sadie and Caroline this morning, this all needs careful planning from the outset of projects. This isn't this nice little extra added on um, that we go, oh, well, we've got a nice site like Must Farm that's <laughs> fabulous. Um, this should be part of every project, not just the excavation, it's the post -ex as well. So a caveat, <laughs> you can also do it really badly um, so if you haven't managed to maybe invest in some of the training then things can go very badly wrong as they did for the British, Arm uh, British Army British Museum's life in the Roman Army um, that text is rather small so I will read it out so um, uh, the, the main bit at the bottom says come for the Romans stay for the romance and then the text that sits on top of the rather fascist style imagery that's in the um, exhibition says, and it's rather small on my screen as well, girlies, if you're single and looking for a man, this is your sign to go to the British Museum's new exhibition, Life in the Roman Army, and walk around looking confused. You're welcome. <laughs> really. So I suspect quite a lot. One of us in this room saw this. We were all quite angry when we saw this. The British Museum's initial response was, oh, well, it's a joke and it plays on a meme and you're, just, you're not getting it. It's like, let's not mansplain the misogyny. Um, uh, eventually, they took it down um, and there's a really good exploration. Um, and the whole event and fascist imagery uh, in Claire Millington's um, uh, blog there, so I'm not going to go on about it. But for me, the reason that this could happen is actually rooted in what is happening in that exhibition and in some of the narratives that are being um, talked about um, in that exhibition. So this is um, a photograph of one of the, the large wall displays in the exhibition, a um, little bit light, so I'll read it out. So it says, he sent me word about a woman. With my consent, he was buying one for me. Now, this is a quote from um, the letters that they use throughout the um, exhibition. And I think this is where the how and the what um, really come to the fore. So the what, yes, this, this does need to be there. This is important. It's important that we think about the ways in which women were commodified um, in the Roman world and interacted uh, with uh, the Roman army. The problem is how it was done. This quote is just put up on a wall with no further explana explanation, no invitation to think about what this means and to do that really important critical work of what it was like to be a woman. Um, so, the problem with the exhibition for me as a whole is that there are incredible objects, wonderful objects. The what is brilliant, but the how is dreadful. The narratives that go alongside those objects, they lack nuance, they sideline women, they glorify violence. It feels like learning about the Roman army um, when uh, we were in the 1980s uh, and that a whole raft of thinking and um, development has not happened could carry on about that exhibition but I think I've already gone over my time so I will end there. So just some concluding thoughts and things to maybe pick up in uh, the discussion at the end. So the stories we tell are important but how we tell them and who tells them is critical and there's a lot of room for improvement. Um, there are some major diversity issues, gender is probably the easiest one to up on, uh, but there are a whole load of diversity issues in there as well. So it's about who speaks for archaeology, but also who is in our profession, because these two are intimately linked. 
And there's so much more scope for the routine use of creative, non-traditional modes of publication, if done well, carefully, and planned out uh, at the outset. So we can tell different stories and tell them differently. Um, and I'm hoping that we'll hear some of those um, uh, different modes from John and from Adrian. So that's me. Thank you very much for listening.